Well, thanks for coming, everybody, and uh, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, I've been in the business for over 20 years. I've been do doing roundabouts for about 20 years. Uh, worked for city, state, and now I'm th 13th year on my own, specializing in modern roundabouts. So I've had, you know, I've been in, I've been in roadway design and roadway engineering and, and, and specifically intersections for most of my career, or, or all of my career. Um, and so roundabouts, you know, the light bulb for roundabouts went off for me a long time ago uh, in terms of, their, of what they can do for our system. And, um, you know, my outline today is, is broken up into three primary components. Just the first part is the diversity of applications. So when I first started in trying to promote roundabouts, it was always, well, you can't put them there and you can't put them there. And do they work there? And show me an example of this application. And so what, what, what I want to show you in this first part is we're put, I've, I've been working on roundabouts in all contexts in almost all situations. There are, of course, places they don't work. Uh, we're going to talk about design principles and the composition of design so, and, and what's necessary to achieve successful projects, which is safe, well-liked, well-received roundabout projects. And then lastly, we're going to look at a, a, a one project example that sort of illustrates um, you know, the transformative, you know, using some of the language from the, from the theme of this conference, which is innovation and transformation. Uh, roundabouts are transfer, transformative. They have the ability to reshape our roadways in, in many ways that s traffic planning with signals don't allow. So there's, you know, spread through the course of the, of the uh, presentation today, you know, human factors, design composition. Uh, you know, when you place a roundabout in a context, that roundabout design has to work in that context, right? So design comp composition is both the roadway and the, and the roundabout intersection working together. And I want to leave you with what, what's necessary for successful projects. So, you know, urban constrained applications, you often hear that, well, roundabouts take too much right away. We can't, we can't use them. They're, they're, they need to be so big. Well, here are a couple examples of very constrained, smaller roundabouts. Here's, you know, a, on the left, a transitional suburban application, maybe 45 mile per hour. Uh, county highway, and on the right, it's a high-speed divided four-lane roadway. When I was with the Wisconsin Department of Transportation, uh, I implemented a similar roundabout like this. It was the first one on a, on a divided U.S. highway, and it was a big deal because, well, we've never put one on a divided high-speed highway. Well, the key is addressing the context and the speeds and the driver expectancy of that application. Not that you can't put it in there, but you need to address those design issues. And then interchanges. We're using roundabouts at lots of different interchange types uh, as well. So these are all just intersections and the placement of, of roundabouts at the intersections within our system. So this is excerpted from Federal Highway's uh, context-sensitive design. I mean, we, we have lots of different um, acronyms and, and, and sort of buzzwords, you know, livability, context, sensitive design, practical design. Anyone think of anything else? Any others? Um, but roundabouts really fit well within, within these categories, you know, from the perspective of the ability to achieve community objectives, of balancing uh, multimodal needs, um, moving traffic without necessarily destroying a neighborhood or a community. Um, they can allow for reduced impacts and costs, as a, as particularly in a system application, which we'll look at uh, in, in a couple of examples. They can, you know, reduce the need for uh, uh, impacts to allow for uh, minimizing uh, historic or environmental impacts, and again, meet a multimodal safety capacity and, and mobility needs. So these are the traffic planning components of roundabouts that are different from signals. 
in large part, our arterial roadway systems, our planning level roadway design standards are predicated of the needs of signals along those roadways. So our cross-section thresholds uh, with respect to ADT volumes are a function of you know, the saturation flow rate of a signal. Um, progression, intersection spacing is, is a, a necessity for signal progression. We don't have progression at roundabouts. Therefore, intersection spacing is, is afforded much more flexibility than with signals to, to move the same amount of traffic. Um, and this is an interesting one, the, the fact that all movements have the same priority. So from an access management perspective, you know, if you look at the access management uh, guidelines out there, it talks about the fact if you have a roadway, say it's an arterial roadway, and you implement good access management standards, you can inc increase the capacity of that roadway 20 to 30 percent. Well, that's always difficult because we need to balance the needs of, of businesses and their access wants and needs along those roads. Roundabouts have opportunities. With signalized intersections, the through movements more often than not have the, have the uh, priority, right? They get, they get the less, least delay. Lefts are, 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 are gonna have more delay. Uh, with roundabouts, it's the same priority. Whether you're making a U-turn, a right turn, or a through movement, it's the same priority. And so, for example, this right turn, right in, right out into this a uh, large commercial site here, the lefts out are the most problematic for both safety and capacity. And so the nice thing about a roundabout here is right out, you turn back the other direction. Conversely, you have access on this side. And because they're anchored on either side with two roundabouts, the lefts out here are precluded. But from a circulation and directional movement perspective, that person can make a U-turn there to go back the other direction. So it, it provides circulation that's, uh, that's necessary for, for vibrant communities. So here's an example of, you know, roundabouts, you don't have to widen the road. You can flare at the entry. That doesn't work with signals. That's why we go from two lanes to four lanes, very much bread and butter type of work, whether it's four or five or six lane type sections, which is illustrated here on this widening. This, this widening is actually just south of this project here, which is, this is an old town part of this small community. And we replaced a signal with a flared entry roundabout, which allowed all of the legs to remain as a, a one lane of traffic in each direction, flaring to a two lane entry. So providing the capacity at the intersection without necessarily having to widen all the roadway uh, links and segments leading up to it. From the perspective of bikes and peds, bikes in particular here, roundabouts offer many advantages that from whether it's cycle track um, or, or, or on, you know, off street cycle track type uh, facilities or on street facilities. Uh, here's a project where this has, uh, we're implementing off street cycle uh, pathways and the crossings are at the slow uh, areas of the roundabout crossing. So that's that direction and then back the other direction for an off street 10 foot so, uh, wide path. And, and if a cyclist wants to stay on the road, and we'll, we'll see a couple of examples of this in a, in a few moments, the speeds of the roundabout when designed well are low. So the speed differential between cyclists and, and motorized vehicles are more similar. So as a, as a higher level cyclist, those comfortable on the roadways, it's, um, it's a comfortable environment. Here's an example of, of, a, of a high volume, three lane entry roundabout here, but we have a shared use pathway on just one side of this interchange project. And I designed this in a manner to improve safety for peds and bikes across this entry. First of all, they're, they're placed at the slowest part of the roundabout at the entry, a, a car length or two back from the yield line, which was uh, based on you know, decades of research in, 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 out of Europe. And we have raised islands that separate the crossing. So as a, as a pedestrian or a cyclist, you know, slowing down, you're dealing with one stream of traffic at a time in one direction, and then crossing, and then crossing again. 
And it's, it's worth noting that as a, as a driver, when we're going slow, it's so much easier to yield and you're so much more apt to yield and slow down for a pet or a bike when you're going slow. So here's that project that I showed of, of the, uh, you know, we, didn't ha we have capacity expansion without roadway widening of this project, which was important to this community. It's an old town. They're trying to maintain on-street parking and, and a viable, um, vibrant uh, downtown. So this is a, about a three-minute video that gives a, a quick overview of this project. Um, beginning with what it was. It was a very congested, signalized intersection. Um, and there's lots of businesses at the quadrants of this intersection. And the queuing from the signal comes back through the driveways, making it difficult for in ingress and egress to those businesses. Uh, you can see you know, uh, uh, someone waiting there. Uh, so you either have queues back through driveways or you have the at-speed condition, which makes it difficult for driver, drivers to uh, uh, get on and off the road, which reduces our safety and capacity of the roadway. That's why we, you know, in our planning, we tend to want to uh, preclude those movements and or remove or move them further away from a signalized intersection. Whereas with roundabouts, we can include uh, access closer to intersections. Um, without the same detrimental effects. So there's, there it is. We, we're precluding access by just putting in a median and making everything right in and right out for the most part with the signal. With the roundabout, we allowed almost all the access. We, we precluded some. We allowed most of them to stay as a full movement access. We did have some impacts on this quadrant here to implement this roundabout. And this is a flared two-lane entry roundabout in a community that has no roundabouts. Um, lots of consternation, and it was you know, challenging to implement. Lots of uh, concern in the community. Uh, this, is, this is a state highway and a county trunk highway, um, around 30,000 ADT, lots of trucks. There's peds and bikes. This, this roadways connect residential communities to the downtown. So there's a, a fair amount of uh, kids and, and people on bikes that, that come across here to, to get to other places in town. So it really represents you know, multimodal, freight, vehicles, peds and bikes uh, in a flared entry design, which is very much uh, a UK style design, which allows, again, for that two-lane roadway, in this case, you know, a, th a third lane uh, near the intersection for access control. Um, so it, it's worked out really well. Here's a uh, I shot some recent drone footage showing, so we talked about the fact that just to, you know, that, this, that the vehicle speed and the cycling speed, so this is a cyclist who's on the road, and you'll, you'll, if you can track that cyclist coming through, he slowed up a little, but you can see the speed differential between the two, the cyclists and the cars is very similar. And then here's an example. You can see him there. Uh, it's a group of teenagers, um, middle school age, maybe early high school, there's one kid, you can't tell, but he's on the handlebars of the, one of the bikes, kind of stuff I did when I was a kid. This is a community where not everyone wears helmets still. It's a smaller community, and they don't have that same, it's, it's you know, so they've, they've, they've made it their way to the uh, pedestrian, the refuge area, kind of waiting their turn. Vehicles are slow. This is designed in a manner to keep vehicle speeds 20 or less in between the crossing areas. And so again, when you're going slow as a driver, you're much more apt, and all the studies reflect that, to yield to pedestrians. So roundabouts really facilitate uh, what we're desiring, multimodal mobility and safety. 
So design principles and composition. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Engineering is often a lot about the parts. I mean, that's the nature of our business. But roundabouts, there's a lot of design components. There's synergy between geometry, signing, and marketing. All, the, all of those design elements need to come together to optimize safety and to achieve successful projects. So why are these important? So in the US, we're learning why. Here's a project, and I've, I've taken out most of the names, not trying to embarrass anyone, or the point is not to call out anyone in particular. It's just that these three projects have 110 to 160 property damage only crashes in a year. That's a lot of crashes. That's politically problematic. That's safety, it's problematic. I mean, they're, they're not serious crashes, but it's still problematic. And so all these projects, so why is that? So is it the drivers in that community? They don't know how to drive roundabouts? Or is it the design? Um, here's the, the project that we were just looking at the video. So part of it is, well, how many, we're, it's relatively new in the US, multi-lane roundabouts. How many property damage only crashes are, are we supposed to expect? So as we start tracking, as I've tracked my projects, this project is averaging 20 property damage only per year for a two by two roundabout. The previous slide showed two by two roundabouts having 100 PDOs, order of magnitude higher. So this is pretty good. There's 16 conflict points as illustrated here, two by two, two lane entry, two lane circulating. Two times two is four, times four legs is 16 conflict points, so that's part of, part of it. The amount of traffic, around 30,000 ADT. Okay, traffic, conflict points, and the design, these all affect safety. This is a, the three lane roundabout, but it's a three by one. So you hear a lot of people say, well, we'll never do a three laner. Well, three by three is different than three by one. This is three times one, which is three conflict points, which is less than a two by two with four conflict points. And this is, this is uh, performing really well, this roundabout. About 15 crashes per year average over five years of data. And these are projects that I'm familiar with. I've designed them. I know what went into them. And, and what, what they have is these foundational uh, design principles. Okay? So a picture of a foundation. Um, so what are these? These are based on research predominantly out of the UK. Um, they did a ton of research and they found some very uh, 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 fundamental safety requirements. Maximize the angle between the legs. So 90 degrees is safer than something that's higher than 90. Minimize the number of legs. Three legs is going to be safer than four, and four legs is going to be safer than five or six. So the extent that you can minimize the amount of legs, that will improve your safety. Fee angle, entry angles, I'm not going to get into the details, but these are important. Okay? How important? They seem to be pretty important. Okay? Um, it goes on. Speed control, one of the predominant foundational elements of safety. Entry and fee angle, which I just mentioned, which is illustrated there. View angle left, important to avoid s severe neck turning. And then sight distance. And actually, it's, it's different than we're used to with roundabouts. What the safety research calls about is precluding unnecessary sight distance, improves safety. It slows people down. And then from a signing and marking, so those are sort of the foundational horizontal geometric components. And from a signing and marking component, the human factors research points out the fact that our designs should reduce the demand made on drivers to improve comprehension. So if that's, then that's true for just general intersections and general roadways. It's going to be true in spades for roundabouts. Our multi-lane roundabouts are, are often getting over-signed. Okay? Um, lots of sign clutter, lots of compressed information, high cognitive workload information overload. She says it's, it's okay, but it's pretty frustrating because there's too many signs. You know, here's an example of a, of a UK style advanced directional sign. And here's a US, actually North American, this is in Canada. They're both green and white. They're both big. They both have a lot of information, but which one reads better? The one on the left or the one on the right? One on the right, everyone, so the one on the left, raise your hand. One on the right, raise your hand. 
All right. So why is that? Different colors. Different colors, different sizes of I can I can easily see what's the major road, what's the minor road. It's better it's a better design. Got a tree block what's that? Got a piece of tree in the block. Well, irrespective <laughs> of the tree, yeah. So let's look at the application of design principles and the composition and, and what that means. So here's an, an example of a concept that I was asked to do a, a review on and redesign to optimize for safety. So that's the initial design. And then after I apply all these d foundational design principles, it looks like that. From arm's length, no one, tell, no one could see too much different. But it, in a, at, a, at a detail, here I'll just go back and then forward. They, 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 they're different. The shapes are different, the angles are different, everything's different. I've met all those foundational design principles simultaneously for all legs, for the whole project. There's a look of it, and then you can see we, it, we have some uh, uh, per peripheral pathways as well as uh, the crossings, uh, as well as on-street bike lanes, so a, a complete multimodal project. So example number two. So this is a project, initial concept. So it has a skewed uh, angle, you know, much greater than 90. That's, that's uh, 90 plus 45, 135, 140 degree angle. And we know that we need to try to square that up. That also affects the ability to meet your speed control. So that's very fast in its initial design. So first thing we did was try to maximize or, or get that as close to 90 as we could. Okay, and, and, and that improves safety for everyone. We also then meet the, what's referred to as the entry, the angle, the, the angle which is called a fee angle. And that improves your, van, your view angle to the left. When that's too flat, it looks and feels, the body language of the roundabout, when it's too flat, is that it's a merge condition. So, and it confuses the priority of people yielding at the entry. When it's very flat, it feels more like an on-ramp. So people tend to not slow down, and you get more entry crashes, entry and circling crashes. So when you meet these foundational principles, you are sending the correct visual uh, cues and messages to the drivers of who yields to who. So it's a reinforcement of the markings you yield to circulating traffic. What time is it? Two minutes, can I go over a little bit? Go ahead. Okay. So this is the, this is the fun, this is the end, this is the case study, maybe take five minutes or so. Um, this is, a, this is a, uh, the Monterey Peninsula in California, which is south of San Francisco and north of LA. Um, Pebble Beach Golf Course is, is located along here. Uh, this, is US, this is US Highway 1, California Highway 1, and actually this is US Highway 1, California State Highway 68. It's a predominant um, access point into the whole Monterey Peninsula, which is an interchange with an access to the Pebble Beach community and golf course, and the on-ramp here. So very congested. I don't have a video of this. Actually, there is one on my linked on my website. But long queues of traffic going back up uh, this road. Severe congestion. This this initial conventional signalized intersection here and here was on the books for 20 years with Caltrans. Um, five lane widening. It's very it's very. Um, environmentally sensitive through here. There's a structure, there's embankments, there's sensitive species, both uh, trees and other critters. And it was gonna cost $30 million. No one had the money for it. Um, the local uh, lead, uh, Rich Deal, who was with the city of Monterey, thought roundabouts might be a good idea. Um, so around about here, here, and here, so instead of 30 million, we don't have to widen the road. We can do it for 10 million. And that's what got put in. Okay, it's a, a, a single lane to a flared two lane entry. The existing two lane bridge was maintained. Access to Pebble Beach was maintained. It's averaging about 
less than five PDOs over the last, it's only been open for a couple years. There's eight conflict points of this project. Um, it was voted the best use of government funds in 2017. Um, show video if time permitting, I won't show it. But there's a video I have linked on my website that it's actually, it's really nice. As, as a consulting engineer um, and as a specialist on projects working on teams, I don't often get invited to the groundbreaking ceremony, right? The muckety mucks get to go to those, and some of you guys might be those guys, which is great. There's a video that just talks about how impactful this project was for this community and just how much congestion they had, how much nicer it looks. Uh, how pleased everyone is. I can tell you it was a lot of work, okay? It didn't just happen. I mean, both, you know, public involvement, funding, all the, all the essential elements of a large project like this. It's, I don't want to uh, uh, make any illusion that it, wasn't, that it wasn't hard, okay? It was a difficult project, but it turned out really well. It came even to the point where towards the end of the project, the, the local guy who was the champion of this project, he started to get nervous with this two-lane entry. Look, at the, look how short the merge is from there to there. I have done this before in very constrained situations, and I knew it would work if it was designed well, and then if, it's pavement, if the markings are laid out properly and well, which is, that's the last chance to affect your design. So uh, he email exchange, I said, Rich, that's fine. You could, he was gonna make it just a single lane, and then maybe do this later. And I thought, that's fine, you could do that, Rich. I said, but this will work. You'll have more capacity. It's going to be safe, but it has to be marked well. Well, I got an email from the guy I was working through. He said, you're coming out to help lay out the markings. So if it doesn't work, we know who to call. So it worked well. So if you have any roundabout design uh, services, I, I do roundabout design, peer review, uh, traffic planning, engineering, design training, public outreach, et cetera. I've written a number of papers. These are all uh, um, available on my website. And with that, uh, I'll thank, I don't know if you want to take questions now or later. Right now. Right now, if there's any questions. Uh,